so this would be chapter 12, the, the complete integration. And uh, from chapter 10, Russ uh, conducting uh, with John's input, uh, the author's input, and then last week with Luisio uh, giving his presentation, this chapter 12 is going to be a, a conglomeration of those various activities together. Uh, what we're going to be doing is using a TensorFlow library called ML5, and that will allow us some, uh, we're going to use a training model and then compare a particular image and then give a confidence level on how accurate that particular photo is or not. So the, the chapter is going to be, the, the initial part of the chapter is just setting up that entire uh, scheme and some of the snippets that I have in here, I'm hoping that uh, you and I can go back and forth and kind of relate on what's what's happening, the, the relationship between the Shiny, the server, the UI, the server, and the, and the JavaScript library. So the learning objectives that I've got listed here is review the ML5 library. Uh, I've got that link open that I'll share in a moment. Uh, reflect how the ML5.js is similar to TensorFlow. Um, it's actually just a wrapper on TensorFlow.js. Um, but I have to make a very distinct difference that TensorFlow.js is not 100% directly related or uses completely different libraries than the native TensorFlow that we may be familiar with. Um, TensorFlow.js is by itself its own uh, different process that replicates or emulates the TensorFlow Python uh, library that we're familiar with. Uh, we'll do a quick history lesson on TensorFlow and, and some of the alternatives that um, others may be experienced with uh, as it relates to this machine learning uh, type application. And then we're going to build a Shiny app uh, that utilizes the ML5.js library. So a brief history of TensorFlow. Uh, it was developed by Google, actually Google Research uh, to be specific. Um, they required some level of analytics to be able to process both images, textual, and also any other um, services. And because of that machine learning piece, um, it's very respectful to, to know that, you know, we have our studio. Well, let me get to the next point. Um, it's designed to run machine learning, deep learning, and statistical and predictive ana analytics. The point, um, neural networks are by design their own separate subject, but they kind of are similar to one another, uh, where you have an unsupervised learning mechanism that kind of tries to train itself and then uh, goes off into, into the ether. That's kind of the, what TensorFlow's intent is. Uh, today, majority of our, our conversation, if we use the key term TensorFlow, uh, it may be related, related to a Python library, and that's okay. As we start to bridge between the R environment and the Python environment, we're going to start to uh, work in between these different languages. So it's okay if you are coming from a Python-oriented mindset uh, and have used TensorFlow in the past. Um, this is just a good quick Google search. Uh, I'm not doing anything special here. I just said what library or what what frameworks are similar to TensorFlow. Um, they listed MATLAB, uh, IBM Watson, uh, the Google Cloud AI platform, Amazon SageMaker, uh, the Google Cloud AutoML, RapidMiner, uh, the Azure. Microsoft has its own machine learning studio. And then our own uh, RStudio itself uh, could also be used for machine learning. Those the majority of these should be familiar to staff members. Okay. Uh, the author references that TensorFlow.js is built on top of the WebGL. So GL standing for graphics library. Uh, this is a key, key element because the relation is that JavaScript alone is extremely efficient. When you add a, G, a, G, a GPU processing on top of it, it becomes even more accelerated. Uh, GPUs are often used in uh, like mad, mad number crunching. Uh, so a lot of your neural networks, your machine learning algorithms and stuff, you will access a GPU piece of hardware to render your output, not a direct CPU. Uh, the comment I made towards the bottom here is my experience with GPUs versus CPUs. Um, I would consider that a GPU is by far more superior than a, than a CPU because it doesn't have all of the uh, additional um, responsibilities of running or interacting with the motherboard, the serial bus, et cetera. Um, GPUs in design are just for graphics, uh, being able to, to crunch some polygons. Um, I said keynote, the MLJS is just a wrapper around the TensorFlow.js library. Uh, there's a reference that I make to Dan Schiffman uh, from the uh, ML5 webpage. 
this particular video as a beginner's guide to the ML5 library. And I would, I would be very respectful to encourage anybody to go watch this particular video. Um, I smiled. It's a 23 minute long video, but um, he is jumping around all over the place on the video, uh, trying to make a very enthusiastic relation uh, to what TensorFlow is, what ML5 is, and how it's related. Um, very, very highly encouraged to, to go check that out. Uh, I said, no, 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 TensorFlow.js is written in JavaScript alone, making its distinction key. Uh, we don't want to confuse the native Python TensorFlow that we're familiar with to the TensorFlow.js. They are completely two different animals. Uh, and that's the, that's the beauty here that we're going to, to start to witness. Um, Dan Schiffman uh, does an outstanding job discussing the ML5 library and the video is linked here. Um, before I go on real quick, Arthur, do you have experience with machine learning in your current job role? No, I don't. Okay. I, I know that you've got some stats background and, and just our experience SAS background. Um, I didn't know if, if uh, any sort of machine learning or, or automation comes into your workflow at all. Um, as I, I, used to, I used to do some stuff that I guess might be considered now machine learning, but before, I, I think before these things existed, yeah. That's just a good point. You know, like with, 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 with SAS, like uh, using stepwise integration of, uh, you know, regressors into a regression model and then seeing yeah. which one performs best, you know, is, is a kind of a, press, yeah, I guess the antecedents to what's a lot more elegantly done now and for different kinds yes, of data too. Yep. Yep. One of the, I, I, I have, I don't have a, I don't have an extreme background in machine learning. Um, one of the uh, tasks that I was asked to complete was related to an elastic search cloud uh, or an AWS cloud instance of, it, of uh, the elk stack. And we were going to be using some machine learning uh, features within that Kibana application. Unfortunately, the classification of those variables did not lend itself to running any algorithm or any statistical modeling. Um, so we were working on trying to, to resolve that uh, feature before we could we could turn up uh, any of the, the, the native. If you were to use uh, Elastic as a log data analyzer, um, it would be far more native to Apache logs, Linux logs, uh, kind of server level uh, being able to, to pull out when anomalies kick out, if you start having hardware failures, et cetera, um, you can have additional workflows that flag, you know, hey, your network's going down, there may be a vulnerability, security risk, et cetera. And that's all extracted from log data at any rate. In the next section, this is the discovery phase, and I'm, I'm using the heading levels from the book to uh, reflect on our, on our presentation. So the, the first chapter, I'm sorry, the first section 12.1 is discover. Uh, the author recommends reading and interpreting any of the libraries that you exercise. So the paths that you're, you're using to build, and this is just a native uh, software development type workflow is you always want to read or become acquainted with the documentation of a given library. Uh, so the second is review and get a high level idea of the use case examples uh, in our packaging in shiny apps and engineering production grade shiny apps, there's always this uh, uh, undertone reflection of documentation. Anytime you're doing a package development, always, always author use case type scenarios where another developer, some other person that's using your package uh, can kind of orient themselves with how to apply some of the scripts. The remaining part of the discussion revolves around the ML5 image classifier function. Uh, and we can we can go check that library out if we'd like. Uh, the use cases examples also include sound and images. So the ML5 library as a JavaScript application wrapper around the TensorFlow JavaScript uh, library. Uh, the examples they also provide are both for sound and images as well. So we begin with the following script or the, the following snippet. Uh, this is going to be in uh, located in our classifier.js, uh, which we'll see here in a second. But we're going to create a const, a constant called classifier. Uh, we're accessing the ML5 image classifier function, and then passing the mobile net and the mobile uh, the model loaded. This mobile net is a key term, and I'm going to talk about it here in just a moment. But within the function of the JavaScript itself, we're just going to output a log saying the model has been loaded. This is the initial 
notification to our, deep, uh, our, our developer mode, our console, JavaScript console, that just says, I was able to access the library and now I have it loaded and, and in my namespace where I can, I can send and receive to it. The third block at the bottom here is where we actually create the classifier classify. And here we're sending in a document, get element by ID. So this is going to be a, a by default, a loop, right? Where it's, it's listing out an array of all the images within a static file set. Uh, we can load any level of, of details into this particular pass, but just know that JavaScript or the ML5 library is going to be looking at our memory and then creating an array of those files. If we have any errors, it's going to send out an error results. And I believe Lucio made a comment to that, or maybe John, uh, sorry, Russ made a comment to that in chapter 10 uh, about error handling. And then we're going to just send out a console log results. And I'll show this here in a moment when we switch over to the Shiny app. Uh, it is familiar to see what the script is accomplishing, the instantiate the image classifier from the ML5 library. Um, but what is MobileNet? What exactly is MobileNet? MobileNet was a training model developed for this particular application. So uh, there is a unbelievably large quantity of these different uh, training models, uh, or you can create your own if you so choose. The idea would be the training model is kind of the uh, litmus test. Do I match yes or no? And in the previous video, I was uh, reflecting on the Dan Shipman uh, ML5 library video. He made a very, very easy, simple, uh, a square and then drew a median down the center of it and said, you know, my my uh, x coordinate is between zero and 400. And if the if the data falls within, you know, a greater than 200, that's going to be on the right hand side of the image. If it's less than 200, it's going to be on the left. Now, as we pop, pop um, sorry, propagate or, or or create that that model, the machine learning is going to uh, be able to actually internally learn that if I have a value greater than 200, it means it's on the right. If it's less than 200, it's on the left. That's what machine learning is. It's, it's being able to pass information, but not really know what's contained in the information. Let the computer figure out uh, the more important elements. Okay. So going on, uh, MobileNet is that training model. It's, it's, a, it's a training model of images. Uh, it's got approximately 15 million images that it's been trained on. Uh, there's a really cool use case example of the uh, Chihuahua versus chocolate chip cookie. I don't know the name of that particular model, but it's one of my favorite examples. Um, computers actually have a very hard time figuring out uh, the differences between the face of a Chihuahua and a chocolate chip cookie. Uh, there are countless other trained models to use if you so decide. Note the training model is beyond the scope of the presentation. Uh, I'm only adding it here as a discussion element. Uh, finally, we use the classifier classify function to get the element ID of the file that we're going to be comparing uh, of each of the images and then log the results of the finding. Okay. Continuing on. Uh, I did uh, cite or, or reference the actual book, the document um, for this image. I didn't create it myself and it's actually a thumbnail because this was actually a script that created all of the linkage. But uh, what we have here is a image, a file. So this could be a JPEG, a PNG, or some form of, of a visual element. Um, we're going to link that to our Shiny server, okay? not the UI, but the, the server's side. Uh, the server is going to be rendering the UI, observing the event classifier, and then rendering the print output of its findings. But sorry, I go back up here to this yellow box. Everything that's happening inside the yellow box is the JavaScript, the ML5 library. So we ingest the image. It selects the input. We have an action button that we can press to trigger uh, the, uh, the execution of this classification. Uh, we do have a text results output that we're going to link with our R Studio or our server session, and then this classify function. So ultimately, uh, and I'm, I don't want to zoom out, but the differences between what's in yellow versus what's in blue is the JavaScript library versus our native R Studio uh, shiny environment. The, the, the uh, UI and the, and the server functions, uh, the grouping, the relationship to those. Okay. Uh, the author makes a second reference from the last chapter talking about WebSockets to build this relationship between the server and the browser's UI using this JavaScript library. We use a, a technology called the WebSocket. Um, I do intend or I hope 
I haven't read the full entire book. I don't know how in depth we get on WebSocket, uh, but from a, a terminology or definition standpoint, just know that the term WebSocket means that you're establishing a two-way communication between your browser and the server. It's just nothing more than a highway, a pathway to be able to send and receive data. Okay. Uh, recall, yeah, I just mentioned that WebSocket is nothing more than a, a, a two-way exchange between UI and server. All right, so now we talk about the dependencies. How do we actually make this app operate? The first thing that we do is uh, we have to cite a uh, content delivery network or a CDN. Uh, to achieve that, we're going to use this script feature uh, pointing at the source uh, of this unpackaging uh, location, ML5 location. Okay. Now, if you were building an HTML file, you can just put this in the head of your HTML and then off you're running because by entering that, it automatically links to that library. It's kind of like the import feature or for us, it would be like install package and then give some name so it can access CRAN and, and uh, download it local to your machine. Uh, with a con uh, content delivery network, all you have to do is put the dependency there and it'll automatically do the hard work for you. Okay. Uh, for our HTML, excuse me, for our Shiny app, we're going to use the uh, HTML tools library and specifically the HTML dependency function. So we're going to create a, a named object passing it the HTML tools package HTML dependencies function. Uh, we're giving it a name of ML5 version is 043 source and then here is going to be the exact URL destination similar to what we had up here in our path to that JavaScript library. And then finally, the, the script name that we're going to access is called ML5 minimized JS. Um, if we were to go to this URL, um, I don't know this for a fact, I didn't navigate it there myself, but if you were to go there, I bet you there's probably an unpackaged or unminified version versus minified, meaning you're removing all white space. You can see the, the uh, nomenclature min tells uh, you've compiled it to be as uh, small of a footprint as possible in your CPU operation. All right, please pay special attention to the name, the version, the source, and the script arguments. Uh, this isn't a YAML file. It's actually an RStudio uh, uh, script or, or populated function argument function that we're creating. Uh, but if you were to do this in some kind of a YAML format or uh, Docker slash some other language, uh, the name, the version, the source, and the script are important as dependencies because you only want to access these single elements. Okay. These can change depending on if the developer releases the new version of a package. Uh, they may uh, deprecate or, or truncate that uh, release. So you may have to update your package to ensure the, uh, the correct path to the, to the service, the, the library. Um, I'll pause here for a second. Arthur, do you have any, any comments or thoughts so far? No, so, so far everything is uh, very clear. Okay. I, will get I was to... actually just following the URL to the unpackaged site to see what exists and Did how you? big they were. I, actually, they're pretty big files. <laughs> Are they? Okay. Okay. Well, um, I mean, so it's like the JavaScript file is a 2.6 megs. Well, at least it's bigger than what I expected for a. Yeah, that would be fairly large for a, for a JavaScript for sure. Um, I, I guess I should make a comment to that that uh, that relation. Um, anything on the web, anything web development side, you always want to be as small of a footprint as possible to maximize the network capability of whatever you're using to interact with. So if you're on a 14K dial-up modem, you know, versus a, a high-speed ethernet fiber type network, um, you want to be able to minimize the amount of traffic call uh, with your content delivery network, the CDN, or uh, your interaction between the browser and server. Good point. All right, so the next uh, section here is talking about the static files that we're going to feed it. Um, this is very arbitrary. There's nothing special about this particular path. Uh, really, it's a completely separate script altogether. Uh, we're just creating a, uh, an access point uh, to Wikipedia to grab a couple of images. Now, I, I personally, from an optimized standpoint, I would not recommend writing the script in this format, but for the purposes of our explanation, I don't want to uh, pass any judgment on on what it is we're doing here. Um, I would rather go from a more API standpoint and go grab a larger library. Uh, that's a separate topic, so we can we can change this as needed. 
more importantly though, we are creating a directory called assets. Uh, we'll see this here in a second when I switch over to our uh, our studio side. And then the two that we're going to be downloading is uh, Flamingo and I, uh, uh, Laura Keat. I'm sorry, I'm not a, uh, a bird person. I don't know the, the actual name of my birds as well as I probably should. But all we're doing is grabbing two different uh, images, this Flamingo and Laura Keat. Um, and then finally, the, the last script is the execution of the download. So we're saying go to the destination, sorry, go to the uh, named URL path, grab it from the internet, and then put it in this assets and then label it Flamingo JPEG and Lorikeet JPEG. Um, I have reason to believe, I don't know this for a fact, but if you have a TIFF, GIF, PNG, uh, some form of a raster naming convention, I would venture that ML5 will probably accept it. Um, I want to double check there if we go into vector graphics or any other sort of naming convention, um, if there in, is any handlers for those other file types. So, all right. The next is we're going to, to create this classified JS. This is going to be our own local, uh, we'll call it the, uh, the middle person exchange between our, our studio session and the JavaScript library ML5. This classifier JS is just able to manage the paths of exchange between those two. Okay. There is a reference to the library directory or the tree output of this directory. Um, I do want to pay special attention to this. When I initially started this uh, chapter, um, I ended up having my classify JS or my assets uh, in a different area, uh, and it didn't render, it didn't work. Well, that's really due to this app.r or the shiny environment having it loaded as a namespace path. So make sure that you do follow this directory tree structure or the application won't render, it won't work. That's not a ML5 point. That's not really related to JavaScript. It's just an R thing. Uh, you want to make sure when you execute your Shiny app, the server and the UI, uh, and it, it generates your, your library output, your server itself, uh, that it has the ability to access these files. Uh, we'll need to include the UI, so uh, we will execute a add resource path line. Uh, I'm going to go to the next section because this is going to start to uh, show you what this Shiny app will look like. So the, the skeleton or the initial framework of this from a linear reading of the textbook, it's accessing the libraries, getting a recognition of it, building your tree or your, your directory library. And then here, we're gonna start populating it. With this next example is the, uh, the actual shiny script itself. Uh, I did make a reference that uh, if this were to go into more of a packaging slash engineering level, uh, or a maintenance level, uh, I wouldn't use an app.r a single file. Uh, this is too limited. I would definitely branch it out to a ui.r and a server.r. Okay. All right. So what we're doing is instantiating the library Shiny. Uh, we're going to add a resource path so that Shiny can access this asset library, that Java uh, classify.js file. Uh, we have a couple of dependencies. That's the first point that I had at the very beginning of our presentation. Uh, we're going to use that uh, more RStudio oriented CDN reference so that when we compile, we're going to have that uh, script at the top. Uh, inside our browser end, uh, we're going to create that dependency to ML5, which is above. We have the tag tags of head. Uh, this is going to be both assets and then classify.js. That's that directory tree reference that we need to make sure we're, we're following. Uh, we do have an input ID. This is called select bird. We have a label called bird, and then choices are going to be either Flamingo or Lorikeet. Uh, in a moment, when I switch to the browser, you'll see what the importance of these input and labels. We have an action button called classify, uh, and then we have an, a, a UI output card called bird display. That's just the footprint on our browser of where the image is going to be projected. On the server end, server side of Shiny, uh, we're going to create that bird display rendering the UI uh, path being the assets and then whatever named JPEG. And then the input is the select bird. The tagged output in images will be sourced to the path, uh, this asset location where the, the image is located, and then the ID bird. Uh, give me just a brief moment and I'll show you what that uh, will look like from the uh, developer mode console form. Okay. 
All right, there is a note here that says it is important to view the directory tree. Initially, I made an error uh, with the assets where uh, the created root repo directory. After moving the folder into the examples, chapter 12 and then image classifier, I was able to render the, the server. Continuing on. All right, uh, I'm gonna pause here, Arthur. I'm gonna switch over to RStudio real quick so we can kind of uh, see this uh, uh, directory tree type lineup. Uh, because I'm doing this from my own desktop, I just want to make sure that what you now witness is the R Studio session. Okay, good. All right, so briefly, I wanted to show you the files that I'm dealing with here. Now, this is inside our JavaScript library. So, um, just to show you what I'm doing, we have a chapter, uh, sorry, we have our entire book repo, our, our the repo. Uh, inside is an examples directory. Inside uh, examples is chapter 12. Inside chapter 12 is this image classifier, and that's the name that I provided to it. With that directory tree, we have our add assets.r. This is the script that I referenced to download images. And then we have the app.r. This is the shiny app itself. Inside, we have this classifier.js, and then the flamingo and the lower key JPEG files. When we execute, going back to my browser real quick, when we execute the, the sorry, go back one. I want to just make sure that I'm the importance of this one element right here, actually this one, this tags element. Shiny is a compiler, right? Or, or our studio is our framework that we're authoring in. Shiny is the language that transposes from a classic R studio. Uh, or our scripting format into this more HTML web-friendly type format. It is imperative that this is understood. We don't know where the path is necessarily, right? Well, we're, we're creating the named variable saying to uh, create a text line that says assets and then whatever the name JPEG is, but we, we don't know which JPEG we're selecting. That has to be a variable from the, from the user. Because it's dynamic, because we have the ability of, of repopulating this, um, we need to create that refresh point when I select the classify and change the image name, or actually it's the drop down. When I drop down and select my different images, I need to be able to recreate that reference call. So this is a dynamic method of being able to populate the pointer at where that file is located on the server's end or the, the computer's end. Let me show you what I'm referring to. Let me get over here. I don't know how to actually move this. Here. Just get it out of the way for a second, sorry. Um, I'm gonna go into inspection mode for a moment. And I, I know I'm off on a tangent, but I, I wanna make sure we're clear on exactly what I'm, what I'm re referencing here. So I'm gonna go to this person and say inspect, highlight that in the code. What we're doing is we're creating an image tag we're populating that image tag as an HTML reference. We're giving it the source, path, asset, and then whatever name we have. And we're calling it the ID as bird so that the rest of the script can also reference it as well. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had to debug or work with other HTML developers, web developers that may not properly render this path. Let me rephrase that. An HTML developer or a web developer is gonna know immediately how to manage uh, uh, there's two forms. There's an internal and external form of, of referencing. Um, this populated path, because we're our studio book club, I want to make sure how that's being built, uh, the, the format of how that's being built. Let's get out of here now. Okay. Now we're going to be discussing the relationship between uh, the R side of the user, okay, the UI, passing this information to the, the JavaScript library. The JavaScript library has to pass it to the server side. The server side has to render it and pass it back to the UI. So it's this big round robin process. That's what that image earlier was, was relating. Okay. So to do that, we're going to create another entry called observe event. This is going to take the input classify from the session and then send a custom message to this classifier and then whatever list we create. Um, in addition to the classify.js library, 
we also have to be able to manage or uh, receive that and do something with it. And this is where the console log results comes in. Uh, maybe it's this, maybe it's this whole chunk. Yeah, I think from the previous, I don't think this existed. So this is a new entry that we're, we're adding to our classify.js. Uh, note, I had to, to add an additional semicolon to this script. Um, I don't know if that was a requirement, but it wasn't rendering unless I put that in there. So um, to, the, to the future of our book clubs or to the future of this book, um, that extra semicolon was included. Uh, okay, so this is all fine and good. And I, I don't actually run this example because it doesn't really do anything other than the Shiny app is running and it shows me my image. It, I can select my drop down menu and select back and forth. I won't call that elementary. I'll say that it's a very uh, simple test case of the Shiny app working, but we're not really doing anything with the ML5 library just yet. So I said, you can open developer mode, go to your console output, and you'll see an array that was created and the confidence level that was uh, uh, rendered when I passed this image. My point being is, go back here, sorry, I'm jumping around. In the initial, I did not have this uh, management of this text output. So instead, it was just the image, and then you had to go into developer mode to see the confidence level. Let's do this again real quick. And so to achieve this, we're uh, using our uh, Chrome Inter uh, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari. So, uh, most browsers have some level of developer mode, but ultimately we're going to our console session. Uh, let's see here. Can I run that? No, it's not working. Shoot. No, it's not that. So that could be here either. Uh, let's try to refresh. Is that it? Well, at any rate, I'm I'm losing my place here. Uh, I want to find that where it builds the array. Uh, we had that in the classify.js, we said the model was loaded, we had that text output. This is just a confirmation that the browser, the document object model is accessing that ML5 library. Uh, but now I thought if we, earlier when I was pressing the classify button, I would get a list of texts that gives me the array. No. Shoot, now I'm not able to find where that's populated at. This is actually what it's being built. What was that located? I want to see the execution of this. Yeah, it should, it should be printing to the console. Right, exactly. Right before I shut the laptop down, it was it was rendering exactly what I wanted. Okay, let me just go back to the to the text here. Um, what I'm attempting to do, I'll, I'll use the book as the example here. There's an image that Mr. Cohen had put in for our application rendering, and at the end of the day, this is actually what is supposed to be generated. Um, so we have the labels zero, one, and two. Uh, sorry, zero, one. Zero, one, and two, meaning three, uh, uh, an element of three. Uh, it's going to be the label is flamingo, uh, toucan. Uh, it, it, it's saying it, it kind of looks like a toucan as a confidence level of, of uh, 0 0.04. And then the second label is an American egret, uh, a great white heron, uh, egret, et cetera, et cetera. I wish I could get this particular script to run so that, because you can execute it multiple times and expand it. Um, Ultimately, the machine learning component of the ML5 library is generating this uh, particular confidence level. And that's the important piece here. Um, I was getting this same error 
uh, it was a different reference of numeric value, but it was a favicon error. Uh, this could be related to my environment, uh, could be Chrome, it could be the, uh, the Shiny application itself uh, when, it, when it compiles, but either way, this favicon error was coming through as well. Go back to our presentation. Uh, we also have to modify with the UI and server for the app.r. And I made a comment here, uh, Arthur, to your respect. I know that you've done a much better job with uh, using other presentation frameworks. What I'm hoping, what I was trying to do is I have to actually render this or highlight this text uh, for the, the specification of this presentation. This is actually what I'm, what I added to make the uh, block of text come across this output results render print and then we're we're printing out the uh, mathematics the the actual calculation of that classification value from the ml5 library um let me try something real quick arthur while we're together i'm going to stop the server real quick and let's see if i can start it over again let's see if this will do it Maybe it was when I shut my laptop down and powered it back on. Let's just try and rerun our Shiny app. Uh, app.r. Okay. Uh, so move that over to the server. Okay. Before I execute, I'm going to do, do an inspection real quick to the console. Okay. So we don't have anything going on. It's not under. It's not under that. Okay. So move this down just a moment. What I have is obviously the object bird, the heading level bird. We have a drop down menu, a text select menu of either the flamingo or the lower key. Uh, between these two, if I change it, it's just changing the image that I'm processing, right? Or, or that's projected to the screen. It's the classify radio button, this, this, this action button that actually does all of the work. So let's try hitting classify. I'm not getting it to render at all. Ah, you know what? I know what's happening. Sorry, Arthur, forgive me. I know what's going on here. In the textbook, I know where I'm making my mistake at. In the textbook, initially, it was logging that data to the JavaScript console. We added the next section here, my whole browser's froze up. Too far, too far, too far. Scroll down. It's these two cha uh, chapters, uh, the sections, section 12.6 and section 12.7. 12.6, um, it's only logging it this console log results, that's what puts it in the browser. When I go to chapter 12.7, we modify a relationship between the JavaScript passing it back into the R server. Our server generates it and pushes it back out to the UI for our Shiny app. That's the difference, forgive me. Let's close this for a second. So instead of printing it to the console, I'm just, passing it back into the R server, the R server is passing it to the, to the UI.R and then rendering it so that we have our output here. If I hit the classify button or change our variable say to Flamingo, hit classify again, you can see that the text changes. Forgive me about that. Um, what I do find, uh, I smile about this, because of that, that learning model, right? The, the trained model, the computer, the ML5 library knows by accessing that training model, using this particular image and all the elements about that image, as compared to my training model, here is my confidence level of what I think it may be. So the, the labels that we have are flamingo, jellyfish, mouse, or computer mouse. If I do the lorikeet real quick and then render it again, you can see that I got a bee eater, a dragonfly, darning needle, devil's darning needle, sewing needle, snake feeder, snake doctor, mosquito hawk, and a skeeter hawk. Uh, and then finally it says, I think this is a lower key and here's my confidence level. 
I don't know if this is this is uh, humorous or not, but this data that we're using to populate these labels comes from that training model, the, the, the data that's contained in the training model. All right. And to manage that, that's this print classification. So I we added another line of text in our server and then also in our UI as verbatim, verbatim text output. So these two are related to each other as I render print to create that output to our UI. Now, this right here is when I have to stop the presentation because I didn't get any further with the input handler. Um, from section 12.8 and then going into 12.9, uh, what we're dealing with here is actually packaging this for future use to somebody else. Um, these are all heading level threes. I didn't get that far down. And given an opportunity, I'd like to, to have another presentation next week to cover this last section of actually packaging it as well. Uh, yeah, what are your be, thoughts? That'd be, great. that'd be great. I'd love for you to do that. I think uh, you're you're definitely best place to do so since you've already started the started the example to continue it through to, to its logical end. Uh, I did find what Russ's presentation in chapter 10, uh, John's input to that same uh, topic, and then Lucio's presentation last week uh, really definitely starts to make sense of what's going on here. Um, as a naive individual entering into this JavaScript shiny world of relationship between the two, uh, what I do find slightly cumbersome, but it may just be to my current visibility at the moment, my understanding at the moment, it's kind of almost, I don't know, magical, but not, that's a weird comment to make, where you have the UI itself, or Shiny, passing information to the web browser. Okay, so we're rendering our, our classic Shiny element. Then by plugging in additional JavaScript access, now it's working within the same browsers JavaScript library to do some other activity from the JavaScript library, passing it back to the server so that the server can take that data and project it back out to the server, back to the UI again. I don't, I, I'm, my mind is kind of baffled with the cost of that large wheel of processing. Um, there was a reference made at the very beginning uh, talking about WebSockets and the efficiency of you don't even really need a UI to do this. You could just do it in the browser and then just pass it from the browser to the browser, uh, render it on the screen. Uh, I think that was the beginning of the chapter. Uh, I think it's here. No. I think it's this, the DOM element that contains the image and then a callback function to do something with the results of the classification. I don't think that's it, maybe it's the top here. Ah, here, this paragraph. Um, I didn't put this in the presentation, but this is key. Uh, for those who are already know, uh, so the change that's closed. It's not money either. Uh, the, the author, John, makes a statement that says, if you know what you're doing, you don't really need to pass it back and forth between the UI and the server to have it re-rendered and passed back to the UI. Um, if you know how to remove that, you're just dealing with the JavaScript library and then just passing it back into the own document object model itself. I'll find that exact sentence because it, it, it caught me off guard as I'm reading this. Uh, the, the, the relation the author was setting up is saying that um, this isn't technically efficient, but for the purposes of what we're doing to exercise this relationship between R and JavaScript, um, it's it's right and appropriate that we we manage it in this format. Um, there are definitely more optimal ways to achieve that same activity. So I'll find that exact sentence next week and and highlight it because it's it's important to realize there are always more efficient ways of managing information. So anyway, that's all I have. I know that we still have probably about another ten minutes left in our presentation. Do you want to? Do some Q and A at all? Um, actually, kind of an oddball question, I suppose. I was I was kind of googling it on the side out of personal curiosity. I was I was uh, 
I haven't really worked with Shiny too much in a little while. Um, okay. And I, I was uh, I was a little surprised that there's kind of not a, U, a, a Shiny UI function for rendering images that you had to pass through this, shine, this U, UI output, which looks like it's just kind of a placeholder for anything that's a, yeah. an HTML tag. I, I thought that was quite interesting. Well, so so let me let me just expand on that statement. So there's there's different ways that you can create placeholders, and this isn't a shiny conversation. This is just web development type logic, but you can have iframes. You can have uh, you know the image tag itself as a placeholder, uh, and then with particular credentials, whether it's just rendered from the image stock or if you tell it to be a particular size, uh, x y coordinate, pixel size, height and width. Um, there's ways of managing this. Uh, the, the statement I made to uh, the iframe, uh, if you have like a web page inside of a web page, that's a way that an iframe works. Um, a lot of users that will nest our videos will create an iframe element so that it, it exercises the play buttons and some other dependencies, et cetera. Um, there's one that I have not quite grasped yet. And I, I, I'm gonna make myself sound very naive for making it. I don't know what C data stands for yet. There's a there's a tag in HTML where you can use a C data tag. I don't know what that implies just yet, but I know it has something to do with a relationship or a library access outside of the document object model. Um, I need to look a little bit further into what that C data tag means, but yeah, there's different different ways of achieving that. As that relates to our book club and as that relates to Shiny my experience level is now i know what i need to do from the web's perspective how do i actually achieve that in shiny that's really what my learning path is um, others are the other way i'm familiar with with r now i need to figure out how i can render my web page anyway just a two different ways perspectives of viewing it okay this, uh, this is kind of a neat uh a, a neat like i hadn't really I kind of had thumbed through the chapter, I guess. I got a little tied up with work before the presentation, but it it, sure. it sort of feels to me. I don't, I don't know if the same. You have the same impression, Ryan. Is it feels like it's a little bit of a repeat of uh, of the of the chapter that Lucio covered in, in a certain sense, where we're kind of working through maybe like progressively more complicated thing, yes. or maybe just different different things, but essentially the same. You know the same high level recipe re remains which you know i guess is uh is kind of comforting right um that uh you, you really indeed just didn't need to know these three or four things and you can kind of uh stitch stitch together some r and javascript that's correct the the uh the one the one thing i'll just if, if anybody's watching the video into the future uh that i would recommend is i can't under sell uh, the W3 schools, uh, W3C schools web page, um, because you can execute some of the HTML in its own framework and then kind of see the relationship of what happens. As we extend into this JavaScript mindset, um, just know that JavaScript is nothing more than the action of doing something, right? The management of information to do something. It's not you know, a cascading style sheet of look and feel. It's not the HTML of, you know, the, the actual text or instructions that we're passing. The JavaScript is now giving a more uh, interactive element to that web page. And with that compared into this shiny language, um, you can't undersell exactly the importance of this uh, uh, path. And I know even in my own rhetoric of presentation, again, somebody, watching this in the future they may automatically make that comment and say well i already know how to do that that's fine i support you in that that mindset but there are plenty plenty of users that have no relation or have no idea some of these foundational elements of of what it is we're doing i mean look up the document object model and just read about how exactly that framework is established right the different placeholders and you know, uh, that's that's important as well. Anyway, um, that's all I have uh, for this particular presentation. Uh, I ended up at chapter eight and it's mainly due to vacation, but um, I want to have a little bit of extra time to saturate on the, the remaining five or six sections left. Yeah, no, I, I think I think you did a wise thing of kind of uh, 
trying trying to chop up the chapter at the there's enough space to kind of properly present things and for you know yeah. people to understand it. But I did, the presentation didn't at all feel rushed. So no, I'm, looking good, forward, good. I'm looking forward to the second part uh, next week. One of, the, one of the things that I do want to extend is to capture more images, maybe as an exercise to see what other competence levels, you know, I don't know, pass the dog and see what, the, what this particular mobile net training model kicks back. So I think it's going to render it. I, I believe mobile net is taking into account if it's 15 million images, I have reason to believe that it's probably accommodating the entire animal kingdom in one, in one training model. Exactly. Yep. All right. Well, well, enjoy your vacation, Ryan, and uh, see, I will. see you next week. All right. Thank you, Arthur. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.